se od propasti do sad nas čuj i od sad naše glase i od sad nam budi spas močnom rukom vodi brani budućnosti srpske brod Bože spasi Bože hrani srpske zemlje srpski rod Srbiju nam Bože hrani moli ti se srpski Uvaženi skupe, u ime domaćina pozdravit će nas predsednik organizacijonog odbora 23. Međunarodnog kongresa vizantijskih studija, akademik profesor dr. Ljubomir Maksimović. Distinguished gathering after the national anthem of the Republic of Serbia, on behalf of our host, we will now be welcomed by the chairman of the organizing committee of the 23rd International Congress of Byzantine Studies, academician professor dr. Ljubomir Maksimović. Vaša svetosti, poštovani gospodine predsjedniče Republike, častni oci Srpske i ostalih crkava i verskih zajednica, poštovani gospodine ministre, gospodine predsjedniče Srpske akademije nauka i umetnosti i častnici akademije, gospodine rektore i prorektore Beogradskog univerziteta, gospodo rektori drugih univerziteta, uvaženi gospodine Mladenoviću, podpredsjedniče ovoga grada koji je danas domaćen kongresa, dame i gospodo, drage kolege i prijatelji, Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, here there are 49 flags of the nations which you represent, uh, represent at this Congress and I uh, would like at this very moment just to welcome you to Belgrade. An esperant, chers amis, que vous irez bien ici pendant votre séjour court. Davir fast alles getan haben. Liebe Freunde, um die Kongressbedingungen verbessern zu können. Und wenn Kataferame, Septantus Kopomas, Agapiti Fili, Ieftini, Pefti Monos, Tusomus, Emas, Tontopikon, Diorganoton. Kanjetschna, Дорогие друзья, много народу совпадает почти всегда с множеством организационных проблем. Но мы все здесь, в Белграде, радуемся крепкому посещению Конгресса. Добро пожаловать! 
Cari amici benvenuti, vi auguro una piacevole e felice permanenza a Belgrado che vi aspetta a braccia aperte. Sada bih molio njegovu ekscelenciju predsjednika Republike Srbije, gospodina Tomislava Nikolića, visokog pokrovitelja Kongresa, da se obrati prisutnima i proglasi Kongres otvorenim. And now I'm asking His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Serbia, Mr. Tomislav Nikolić, the High Patron of the Congress, to address the audience and proclaim the Congress open. Molinas. Please allow us. Please allow us to remind our international guests that you can find the Mr. President's speech in the conference booklet so you can follow simultaneously the President's speech. Thank you. Vaša svetosti, Časni oci, uvaženi članovi vlade Republike Srbije, predstavnici akademske zajednice, vaše ekscelencije, dragi naši gosti iz celog sveta. Dobrodošli u vizantijski Singidunu, potonji Beograd, srpsku srednjovekovnu i novovekovnu predstavnicu koja ponosno baštini vizantijsko nasledje. Dobrodošli u Srbiju, u čijim savremenim državnim simbolima, na grbu i zastavi, to vizantijsko nasledje jasno prepoznajemo i čitamo. Ono je utkano u našu svakodnevicu, živo i sve prisutno, identitetski određujuće, iako je zemlja Srbija odavno krenula putevima savremenog sveta. Zato je važno što se, posle prvog susreta vizantologa u Beogradu, davne 1927. godine, ponovo okupljamo u srpskoj predstavnici. Omeđen godinama drugog i današnjeg 23. kongresa, na ovim prostorima se neumorno razvijao splet medijevističkih naučnih disciplina, određen i prožet vizantološkim promišljenjem. Jedan od ključnih nosilaca tog stalnog razvoja, od osnivača savremenih vizantijskih studija, akademika Georgije Ostrogorskog od 1948. godine do dana današnjeg je Vizantološki institut Srpske akademije nauka i umetnosti. Veoma smo ponosni na višedecenijska naučna dostignuća ove institucije, ne samo u okvirima naše zemlje, već i na doprinos koji daje vizantijskim studijama u svetu. Ukazano poverenje Međunarodne asocijacije vizantologa da upravo Beograd danas bude domaćin kongresa, svakako je zasluženo ugledom Vizantološkog instituta Srpske akademije nauke i umetnosti u Međunarodnoj akademskoj zajednici, ali i tradiciji organizacije ovakvih skupova, čije se iskustvo pokazalo uspešnim i u Beogradu 1927. i na okridu 1961. godine. U danima pred nama iz Beograda će ka celom svetu odlaziti snažne poruke o dometima naučnih sesija, o promišljenjima na koja obavezuje i tematsko određenje 23. kongresa Vizantija svetu promenama. U tom kontekstu, želeo bih sa vama da podelim jednu veoma važnu temu, važnu za moju zemlju, koliko i za ceo civilizovani svet, koji bi trebalo da bude zasnovan na pravu i pravdi. Svet koji bi, da bi mogao da funkcioniše, pa i obstane, morao, a vi ćete to najbolje razumeti, da zasniva svoje odluke na naučnim činjenicama i istini. Promene u svetu su stalne, ne dešavaju se uvek na dobrobit čovečanstva. Takav je i pokušaj samoproglašene Republike Kosovo da postane članica UNESCO i da srpsku baštinu na prostoru Kosova i Metohije, koja inače najvećim delom pripada srednjem veku, vizatinskom nasledju srpskog naroda, mimo svih naučnih činjenica i artefakata, pripiše narodu kome ne pripada, i što je još pogubnije, da poveri na čuvanje svetinje onima koji ih kontinuirano decenijama ruše iz krnave. 
i po izveštaju samog UNESCO, četiri srpska manastira na Kosovo i Metohiji iz vizantijskog perioda nalaze se na listi ugrožene svetske kulturne baštine, ugrožene od onih koji se preporučuju da je čuvaju. Moja dužnost i obaveza da vas kao predsednik Republike Srbije, ali i kao čovek, podsjetim na rečena ogrešenja u naučnu istinu i činjenice, uveren da ćete, kao naučnici posvećeni svojoj struci i istini, svakako pronaći motiv da se još više zainteresujete za dvojako ugroženo srpsko-vizantijsku baštinu na prostoru Kosova i Metohije, ugroženu neistinima i pokušajem falsifikovanja istorijskih činjenica, ali i ugroženu doslovno do fizičkog uništenja. U suprostavljanju takvom kontekstu prepoznajem ulogu naučne misli, naučne čestitosti, vašu ulogu. Ne preterujem. A sve ovo ne govorim samo iz nekog isključivo srpskog ugla posmatranja, iako su moja polazišta u tom smislu jasne, već zbog uvida u širu sliku poučen istorijom Vizantije i njenim slomom za vreme Konstantina XI. paleologa, vama ne treba da naznačavam da je po svojoj majici, srpkinji Jeleni Dragaš, bio i Dragaš. Zar se nije i on okrenuo Evropi i obratio za pomoć u borbi protiv nevernika, doživio da ga opljačkaju krestaši, a Venecije iz Vizantije odnese mnogo umetničkih remek dela. Za mene je bolna opomena i upozorenje to što je Sveta Sofija provibitno izgrađena kao hrišćanska crkva u gradu novog imena, Istanbulu, u svoje doba postala najpoznatija džamija. Srpsko nasledđe na Kosovo i Metohiji ne pripada samo jednom vremenu i samo jednoj generaciji. Pripada svima i zauvek. Pripada čovečanstvu. Na Kosovu se ne čuva samo srpska, čuva se evropska kultura, svetsko pamćenje, čuva se važan deo vizantijskog nasledđa čovečanstva. To između ostalog znači pravo Srbije kao punopravne članice UNESCO da čuva svoje nasledđe stvarano po vizantijskom modelu i njegovim izvornim načelima. Molim vas da nam pomognete u nošenju tog časnog krsta, sami smo i osjećamo se kao dragaš. Dragi prijatelji, problem koji danas izgleda samo kao srpski, sutra će biti problem neke druge, pa treće, pa ko zna koje zemlje iz kruga vizantijskog sveta i njegovog nasledja. Svedoci smo da se na mnogim stranima atakuje na same temelje očuvanja vizantijskog i hrišćanskog identiteta, a to znači i na neke od najznačajnijih kulturnih vrednosti mediteranskog i bliskoistočnog sveta. Vi ste, pre svih, svesni značaja ovih pitanja koje se postavljaju pred naučnu svetsku javnost. Na vaše stavove i naučne odgovore oslanjamo se svi mi kojima je misija, ili bi bar trebalo da bude, da kreiramo političke puteve okrenute budućnosti i njenim izazovima. Jer nasleće i iskustvo viznatskog sveta sačuvano stotinama godina posle njegovog fizičkog nestanka, sadrži i preko potrebne putokaze za te puteve. Zato od ovog kongresa očekujemo postavljanje ključnih problemskih pitanja. Očekujemo kontinuitet u očuvanju poruka i dometa vizantijskih studija, a to znači razvoja naučne misli i brige o vizantijskom doprinosu civilizacijskim tekovinama koje su, kako rekoh, ne malo i ne redko, vidljivo ugrožene u ovom našem svetu u pokretu. Dragi prijatelji, za svaku zemlju je redka čast da bude domaćin ovako uglednih, prestižnih međunarodnih naučnih susreta, tim pre što se održavaju svake pete godine, što predstavljaju presek poludecenijske naučne produkcije medijevalista i vizantologa cele planete i što preporučuju osnovne smernice i težišta naučnih izdraživanja do Narodnog kongresa. Za Srbiju Svetog Save posebno. On je, vođen Božjom promišlju, obišao granice do kojih je doprla tadašnja vizantijska kultura. Od Srbije i Svete Gore, preko Soluna, Carigrada, Nikeje, sve do Antiohije, Svete zemlje i Jerusalima, Aleksandrije i Kajra, da bi se sa drugog puta kroz Vizantiju vratio preko Crnog mora u Bugarsku i tu umro. U Amanet nam je ostavio Srbiju i vizantijsko nasledđe u njoj. Želeći vam uspešan rad i srdačnu dobrodošlicu, Proglašavam otvorenim 23. Međunarodni kongres vizantijskih studija.
čuli smo kompoziciju Studenica. Pozdravimo kompozitora, koji je ovde među nama, akademika Svetislava Božića. I pijanistkinju Jelenu Đajić, koji su nam ulepšali svečanost otvaranja 23. Međunarodog kongresa vizantologa. Let us greet the pianist Jelena Đajić and the composer who is here with us today, akademišan Svetislav Božić. Uh, we have just heard his composition, Studenica. So they have embellished the opening ceremony of the 23rd International Congress of Byzantine Studies here in Belgrade. A sada molim predstavnika UNESCO, gospodina ambasadora Bojana Bugarčića, da nam se u ime pokrovitelja obrati. Izvolite, gospodina ambasadore. May I now ask the UNESCO representative? The UNESCO representative, Ambassador Bojan Bugarčić, to address the Congress on behalf of its patron. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Gospode predsjedniče, vaša svetlosti, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished participants of the Congress, I have the distinct honor and pleasure to greet this illustrious meet-gathering of the most prominent world scientists and researchers in the field of Byzantology on behalf of UNESCO, particularly the National Serbian Commission for UNESCO. It would be hard to find any form of human, especially scientific or cultural activity that corresponds more to the noble goals of UNESCO, being those of exploring, promoting, preserving, bringing closer to the present day generations the common heritage of mankind, than the endeavor you have been undertaking. The wonderful civilization you are researching having been in many aspects the most important political, economic and artistic center in the Mediterranean world, or they say Europe as a whole, for a well over a millennium. Its legacy continued to wield its suspicious influence well beyond the confines of the former Byzantine Empire, even beyond what was once considered the Byzantine spiritual sphere. Therefore, it is no wonder that UNESCO has again granted this patronage to this gathering of the foremost world Byzantologists. The G Director General of UNESCO, Ms. Irina Bokova, in her letter to the organizers confirming the patronage of UNESCO to the, of this Congress, mentions the artistic diversity of Byzantine heritage in an enlarged framework between history and modernity, and they recognize this event to be consistent with UNESCO's aim to promote cultural diversity and creativity. We are all very well aware that the world we are living today is faced with many challenges, a multitude of wars and crises. A sense of insecurity and dread over the future permeates the modern man. Besides horrendous loss of human life and misery brought about by wars, we see that many important historic monuments are destroyed, while many more are in peril and their very survival threatened. Among such endangered material monuments that form the common patrimony of mankind figure many prominent Byzantine monuments. Some of them have been declared and listed by UNESCO as such, i.e. as heritage in danger. Not only the territories that once constituted the Byzantine Commonwealth and were decisively shaped by its legacy, but also in other jurisdictions and neighboring cultures with whom it had interacted. This fact only renders your admirable work of historical, philological, art historical, archaeological, and theological research into the civilization of the Byzantine world and of affirming its enduring legacy even more vital and deserving all forms of recognition and support. Uh, Mesdames et Messieurs, en ce sens, permettez-moi de mentionner que quatre pays de notre région ont nommé conjointement les tombes médiévales, stets, avec leur ornement caractéristique et leur symbolisme unique pour être inclus dans la liste du patrimoine mondial. Par sa décision, qui était aussi hautement symbolique, ses efforts conjoints ont été reconnus par le Comité du patrimoine mondial de l'UNESCO, qui les a inclus à la prestigieuse liste lors de sa dernière session en juillet 2016 à Istanbul. Ce résultat est très encourageant, et nous sommes certains, ce n'est que la première de nombreuses initiatives pareilles. La Commission nationale serbe pour l'UNESCO entend poursuivre et promouvoir ces efforts conjoints, dans l'espoir que d'autres monuments, et le patrimoine de notre région, qui est encore plus directement lié à l'héritage byzantin, se verront offrir la même forme de reconnaissance, espérons-le, une protection actrice qui lui est indispensable. Enfin, pour ne pas prendre trop de votre temps précieux, permettez-moi seulement de réitérer le ferme soutien de la Commission Sierra pour l'UNESCO pour votre travail, pour votre mission du gardien promoteur des valeurs culturelles et spirituelles historiques avec lesquelles notre partie du monde est étroitement associée. Nous demeurons prêts à travailler avec vous et vous aider dans vos efforts de quelque façon que vous jugerez appropriée. Je vous souhaite un congrès très réussi et à la bienvenue à Belgrade en Serbie. Je vous remercie de votre attention.
Dragi prijatelji, obratit će nam se predsjednik Međunarodne asocijacije vizantologa, profesor dr. Johannes Koder. Gospodine Koder, izvolite. Dear friends, we shall be now addressed by the president of the International Association of Byzantine Studies, professor Dr. Johannes Koder. Professor Koder, please take the floor. Mr. President of the Republic, Your Holinesses, Senior Representative of the UNESCO, dear President of the Serbian Academy, dear, uh, pre the dear President of the, uh, uh, of the um, Serbian National Committee and members of the Serbian National Committee, dear uh, Rector of the University of Belgrade, dear colleagues and guests, Whenever I mentioned during the last weeks and months <clears throat> in the course of conversations with uh, non-Byzantinists, the 23rd International Congress for Byzantine Studies in Belgrade, I was confronted with different positive or negative reactions on the key word or emotive word, Byzantium. But many of uh, these persons simply asked what are Byzantine studies good for at all? Or what does Byzantium mean today except for some dozens of specialists all over the world? Behind these questions there lies also a more, uh, more general uh, skepticism. Is it possible to learn from history? And if yes, why specifically from Byzantine history? To the ears of the Byzantinists, there is a nice, perhaps even seductive answer given by an American political scientist and strategist known for his controversial books on the grand strategy of the Roman Empire and the grand strategy of the Byzantine Empire. At the end of 2009, he published an article in Foreign Policy entitled, Take Me Back to Constantinople. He had, by the way, borrowed this title from a hit song, Istanbul, not Constantinople, which was created in 1953 on the occasion of 500 year anniversary of the fall of Constantinople to the Ottomans. In this article, he questions, at times of economic and political crisis, the model of ancient Rome. He reproaches the Roman Empire for, as he says, quoting, its ruthless expansion of empire, domination of foreign peoples, and bone-crushing brand of total war. And he recommends better instead to look to the empire's eastern incarnation, Byzantium, which outlasted its Roman predecessor by eight centuries. And he concludes, it is the lesson, the lessons of Byzantine grand strategy that we must rediscover today. It's a recommendation. We had better leave undecided the question of whether it is in fact possible to learn from history at all, and especially in such comprehensive and at the same time concrete lessons, as he told it. But if we can't learn from history to avoid repeating historic mistakes or errors, perhaps a knowledge, a knowledge of history could at least be helpful for a deeper understanding of developments, rational or irrational political actions, or reactions in our present time. This attempt at better understanding should be taken into consideration at the level of national histories and politics, independently of the question whether or not nations and their politicians accept their own past, their myths and national narratives, the presence of history is a reality. A view on Byzantium is necessary because it's cultural, ideological and social traditions are present and li are lively in southeastern and eastern Europe in many societies. Not only as religious and national habits, 
in which case these rites and ceremonies are more obviously visible on the surface, but in varying degrees also in political institutions and social structures. In this context, the venue of our Congress has a particular historic and historic significance for Byzantinists who are well aware that a ruler of the late medieval Serbian state had proclaimed himself emperor in the Byzantine tradition. But Byzantinists should also focus on histories of wider and multicultural areas, to a certain degree on the history of the Eurasian continental sphere and preferably of the Euro-Mediterranean. Both broader views need, of course, more interdisciplinary research than national histories. In particular, an intensification of the exchange of ideas with historians and archaeologists who are specializing in Central Asia and in the Muslim world. Dear colleagues and friends, Byzantinists are an endangered species. Therefore, our future, the next generation, needs to focus increasingly on interdisciplinary uh, research and on networking. In particular, also the cooperation between universities and research institutions of any kind needs to increase rather than, than to be reduced. A consequent balance of research and teaching, thus supporting and challenging young Byzantinists during their postgraduate studies, may bring fresh ideas and new, sometimes perhaps also important results. The principal the theme of the Congress Byzantium, a world of change, is not in contradiction uh, to this. The conveners refer to Maximus Planudes' statement, everything changes, nothing perishes. Planudes translates a sentence in Ovid's Metamorphosis. Omnia mutantur, nihil interit erat et illic. Ovid, puts the sentence into Pythagoras' mouth, who teaches the, um, the met and psychosis, the transmigration of souls. In itself, Planudes' translation demonstrates paradigmatically to us that until the late Byzantine centuries, Byzantine scholars turned their mind back again and again to the intellectual achievements of the past and accepted these achievements. I think the conveners of the Congress want us to share this attitude. Dear friends and guests, more than 1,200 participants from almost 50 countries have come together here in Belgrade to our Congress. At least a half, half of them will present results of their research and ideas for future scholarship in six plenary sessions, in more than 50 roundtables, in special sessions, in free communications and poster sessions. I would like to congratulate the program committee, the organizing committee, and the president of the Congress for managing to impose cohesion and structure on this overwhelming abundance of papers, even the free communications. On the behalf of the International Association of Byzantine Studies, I would like to express our sincere gratitude to the government of the Republic of Serbia, the UNESCO, uh, the Serbian Academy of Sciences and Arts, the University of Belgrade, and all those who gave their moral and material support to the Congress. I hope for all of us, who, all who participate in this Congress, that we shall hear excellent papers and lively discussions, and that in the end we will see great results, an expanding and a deepening of our knowledge and incentives for future research. Thank you.
Dame i gospodo, dragi prijatelji, molim predsjednika Organizacijonog odbora 23. Međunarodnog kongresa Vizantijskih studija, direktora Vizantološkog instituta Srpske akademije nauka i umetnosti i podpredsjednika SANU, akademika Ljubomira Maksimovića, da nam se obrati. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I now invite the chairman of the organizing committee of the 23rd International Congress of Byzantine Studies, director of the Institute of Byzantine Studies within the Serbian Academy of Science and Arts, Akademišen Ljubomir Maksimović, to address the gathering. Mesdames, Messieurs, chers collègues, ceci est un grand moment pour les études byzantines et médiévales serbes. Pour la troisième fois, en moins d'un siècle, les chercheurs servent en l'honneur d'accueillir chez eux les byzantinistes venus du monde entier. Beaucoup d'entre eux appartenant aux générations nées après le dernier congrès tenu dans ce pays. Donc, le, les jeunes chercheurs serbes inscrits en grand nombre à ce congrès ont maintenant l'occasion d'établir un contact direct avec leurs confrères étrangers qu'ils ne connaissaient que de nom, et le plus souvent sur la base de leurs ouvrages. Mais cet événement aurait aussi une portée plus large dans un pays qui, en partie, fonde son identité culturelle et historique sur le monde byzantin. C'est une occasion exceptionnelle qui, manque, qui marque euh, non seulement un encroisement euh, des études médiévales et byzantines serbes, mais qui également suscite auprès le plus vaste public un vif intérêt pour cet aspect de la sphère culturelle serbe. Toutefois, bien que repose sur des bases scientifiques, ces peuples peuvent aussi faire être perçus comme des sentiments du milieu d'organisateurs. Les intérêts réels de ceux-ci sont néanmoins concentrés sur les résultats escomptés de son orientation principale. Laissant de côté le fait qu'à la suite d'une décision de l'AIEB, ce congrès d'études byzantines est différemment conçu par la structure de son programme de précédents congrès, ce qui constituera une expérience à la fois intéressante et indicative, je ne, me, je ne m'arrêterai que sur son orientation thématique principale, également adoptée à la suite d'une décision de l'AIEB. Le titre du congrès « Byzance, un monde de changement » implique que chaque fois que cela serait possible, l'abord de toute description de certains phénomènes tenant à ce monde se devrait de veiller à dégager en quoi et comment ces derniers ont évolué, en s'arrêtant plus particulièrement sur les mutations que sur le contenu et les formes. Il me semble que le programme proposé pour le Congrès suit de façon suffisamment claire cette orientation. D'autre part, les recherches actuelles sur le monde byzantin se trouvent, elles aussi, en perpétuel changement. Celles-ci ne sont qu'une partie des modifications encore plus vastes qui touchent l'étude du moine, de Moyen-Âge en général, mais aussi la totalité du corpus des sciences humaines. Des avancements notables dans le cadre de l'instrument Studiorum un nouvel paradigme de philosophie de l'histoire, un déplacement général du centre de gravité des intérêts sociaux, des améliorations dans la compréhension des sources, ne sont que quelques-uns des phénomènes importants qui, dans ces dernières décennies, ont insufflé à nos recherches un caractère presque turbulent, voire, dans, dans un certain nombre de cas discutables, en allant parfois jusqu'à leur attribuer des traits propres à l'art pour l'art. Il serait donc permis de dire 
que le congrès constituera, en quelque sorte, une rencontre entre le monde de Byzance en permutation et ceux qui l'étudient, changés eux-mêmes par des évolutions méthodologiques et cognitives importantes. Nous espérons qu'il en sera ainsi. Cette rencontre pourrait déterminer la physionomie et les priorités des recherches byzantines dans les années à venir, ainsi que leur place dans le monde contemporain. En tout cas, j'espère que nous abordons un congrès qui sera suffisamment inventif pour permettre d'aller au-delà des dilemmes actuels, relativement souvent exprimés, concernant, concernant la nécessité de la tenue de grands congrès internationaux. La préparation du congrès est le fruit d'un effort soutenu qui s'est étalé sur plusieurs années. Des circonstances défavorables sur lesquelles il n'a pas été possible d'influer ont, ont empêché la finalisation de plusieurs propositions intéressantes concernant certaines manifestations annexes au congrès mais leur idée principale a été préservée. Je voudrais, au nom des organisateurs, exprimer mes remerciements à tous les participants au Congrès qui ont accepté de venir présenter leurs recherches, aux donneurs de parrainage et avant tout au président de la République, aux sponsors et à toutes les institutions co-organisatrices du Congrès qui ont permis sa tenue, voire l'Université de Belgrade, Faculté de philologie et, de, et les autres, au bureau de l'AIEB en tant que partenaire permanent et conseiller du comité d'organisation, au président et à l'administration de l'Académie serbe des sciences et des arts, qui donnait le soutenu permanent, à son institut d'études byzantines et à l'organisation touristique Miros. Enfin, last but not least, je voudrais exprimer ma profonde reconnaissance à mes plus proches collaborateurs au sein du comité d'organisation et autour de ce dernier, provenant des institutions scientifiques différentes, qui ont travaillé sans relâche sur la question d'organisation complexe, parfois difficilement résoluble. Je vous prie de ne pas oublier les noms qui vous sont déjà connus ou qui le seront demain dans le monde des études médiévales et byzantines. Il s'agit, par l'ordre alphabétique, de Smilia Dushanic, Vojadin Ivanishevic, Bojana Krsmanovic, Ljubomir Milanovic, Danica Popovic, Zoran Rakic, Irena Spadir, Dragan Vojvodic, Dejan Jelebjic, qui constitue formellement du comité d'organisation. Mais, sans le soutien permanent apporté par Stane Bojanin, Miloš Cvetković, Predrag Komatina, Tamara Matović, Bojan Miljković, Bojana Pavlović, Miloš Živković, le comité n'aurait pas été en mesure de remplir sa mission. Je voudrais en particulier souligner la contribution de notre collègue Sergen Pirivatric, co-président du comité d'organisation, qui a coordonné la plupart des travaux. La tâche n'a pas été facile pour toute cette équipe et ne le sera pas, au moins jusqu'à la fin du congrès, et je le dirai plus tard encore. Je nourris d'autant l'espoir que les efforts que ceux tous ont investis contribueront dans les jours à venir à l'atteinte des objectifs désirés, ainsi qu'à l'établissement d'une atmosphère agréable et collégiale. Je vous remercie de votre attention. Уважени скупе, са посебном чашћу приступамо најсвећанијем делу нашег данашњег сусрета, церемонији уручења одликовања. Молим члана Комисије за одликовања, 
Komisije predsednika Republike, dr. Jasminu Mitrović-Marić, da nam pročita ukaz predsednika. Estimed audience, it is with special honor that we shall embark now on the most solemn part of our today's meeting, the ceremony of the Decoration Award. May I kindly ask the member of the Committee for Awards and Decorations of the President of Serbia, Dr. Jasmina Mitrović-Marić, to read the presidential decree for us. Please find the translation enclosed in your booklet. Thank you. Dami gospodo, na osnovu člana 112 stav 1, tačka 7, Ustava Republike Srbije i člana 12 Zakona o odlikovanjima Republike Srbije, objavljenih u službenom glasniku Republike Srbije broj 88 kroz 9 i 36 kroz 10, donosim ukaz o dodeli odlikovanja za naročite zasluge u promociji vizantijskog nasledđa na tlu Srbije i doprinos u proučavanju i razvoju svetske vizantologije. Odlikujem Sretenjskim ordenom drugog stepena Vizantološki institut Srpske akademije nauka i umetnosti. Ukaz o dodeli odlikovanja objavljen u službenom glasniku Republike Srbije. U Beogradu, 16. augusta 2016. godine, predsednik Republike Tomislav Nikolić. Molim predsednika Republike, gospodina Tomislava Nikolića, da uruči, a akademika Ljubomira Maksimovića, da u ime Vizantološkog instituta Srpske akademije nauka i umetnosti primi ovo odlikovanje. Poštovani gospodine predsjedniče, male su reči zahvalnosti koje bih mogao izreći u ovom trenutku. Ne samo zbog toga što kao dugogodišnji direktor instituta osjećam sav onaj doprinos koji su moji prethodnici ugradili i u kome ste vi nešto rekli i o ukazu o odlikovanju, nego i zbog toga što vidim jednu širu poruku u ovom gestu. Vidim nešto zbog čega su inače zabrinuti mnogi poslednici u humanističkim naukama, zbog toga što se one danas u modernom okruženju, globalno, tehnološkom, koji je okrenuto jednoj drugoj vrsti razvoja, nalaze u nekako u drugom redu događanja. Ovo odlikovanje jednoj instituciji koja se uporno već tolike godine bavi isključivo humanističkim disciplinama, podstiče takođe jedan krug što se i na ovom kongresu vidi jedan krug kolega iz drugih institucija da zajednički radimo, to je nešto što mislim da treba u ovoj zemlji da bude više zastupljeno. I ovo odlikovanje shvatam kao znak toga. Hvala vam najlepše.
Zahvaljujemo se našoj jedinstvenoj divni Ljubojević i njenim kolegama iz Hora Melodi. Koji su nam u čast svečanog uručenja znamenja kojim je predsednik Republike Srbije odlikovao Vizantološki institut Sano, Sanu, izvinite, poklonili kompozicije. Dogmatik drugog glasa Gavrilu Vješćavšu, Anastaseos Imera, kompozitora iz 13. veka Isaije Srbina, i vizantijski napev Kirije Eleison. We thank our unique Divna Ljubojević and her colleagues from the choir Melody who have granted us with these compositions in honor of the solemn award of the decoration from the President of the Republic of Serbia to the Serbian Academy of Science and Arts Institute for Byzantine Studies. Dragi prijatelji, zahvaljujem se predsjedniku Republike Srbije i našim dragim gostima koji su svojim prisustvom uveličali početak 23. Međunarodnog kongresa vizantijskih studija i ukazali na važnost našeg današnjeg skupa. Dear friends, I thank the president of the Republic of Serbia and our dear guests who have magnified the commencement of the 23rd International Congress on Byzantine Studies with their presence, highlighting the importance of today's gathering. The working part of the session will continue here in this hall, thank you.
U radnom delu današnjeg programa čućemo inauguralno predavanje profesora istorije Vizantije na Univerzitetu Princeton, Johna Haldona. In the working session of today's program, we shall hear the inaugural lecture of distinguished scholar John Holden, Professor of Byzantine History and Hellenic Studies at Princeton University. Professor Holden, please, the floor is yours. So, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, thank you very much. I thought the departure of our friends uh, was just the knowledge that I was about to speak, but apparently not. Uh, first of all, I should say it's a great honor to be able to address you here today. And I want to thank the organizers for their generous invitation to address you at the start of what promises to be an exciting and very productive international congress. Choosing a subject to talk about, given the theme of our meeting, was not easy. While we, within our field, may know differently, it is a sad fact that for very many people, particularly in Western and Northern Europe, the word Byzantium still conjures up a society and a civilization that was static, corrupt, vicious, or backward. There are exceptions, it's true, but these pejoratives still reflect commonly held views among a wider public, in spite of our best efforts. As Professor Koda noted just a few minutes ago, there are several culprits behind such misconceptions. Among them, the traditions of the Enlightenment scholarship and politics of the later 17th and 18th centuries, a period that ushered in some of the most important transformations intellectually and scientifically in Western, indeed in global history, but which, like all ages, generated its own particular worldview and prejudices. Equally culpable are our various national public educational systems, which have inevitably, and since the middle of the 19th century, if not earlier, prioritized, quite naturally, their own nations as they in turn developed their own political and cultural ideologies, themselves replete with myths and invention, as I hardly need to point out. Knowledge and interest in Byzantium in the western north of Europe has never been especially important except in academic contexts. 
And even then, interest grew originally out of the classics, although it should be mentioned, of course, that in the 16th and 17th centuries, interest in Byzantium reflected interest both in the origins of new nations and in contemporary politics, notably the challenge from the Ottomans. For the general public today in Northern and Western Europe, Byzantium means next to nothing other than through the caricatures that I mentioned. The cultural heritage that people see and experience on a daily basis, where they are aware of it at all, has no obvious association with the East Roman world, which just doesn't seem relevant. Views of Byzantium in southeastern Europe are rather different, as Professor Korda also pointed out, and as we've seen very obviously in this morning's proceedings. Here, the Byzantine heritage in art and architecture, living religion, as well as in law and politics, is still a part, visually as well as ideologically, of the world today. But it is equally subject to nationalistic manipulation, and attitudes to the Byzantine world vary considerably from one country to the next. In Romania, it has been ancient Rome and not Byzantium that receives most political and cultural exposure, in contrast to its neighbor Bulgaria, where it's the medieval world that plays a larger role, or Greece and Serbia, where the Byzantine heritage is more specifically singled out. Moving further afield, in Turkey, for example, it has been neither the Ottomans nor the Seljuks, as one might expect, and certainly not Byzantium that receives attention, but rather the ancient Hittites, who are claimed as the ancient forebears of modern Turkey, although there have been recent moves to reawaken awareness and interest in the Ottoman past. And of course, as we know, centers of Byzantine studies now flourish in several universities, yet predictably, popular views of Byzantium lean more towards the images summed up in film advertisements in which heroic Turks fight effeminate and corrupt Byzantines. In film, largely a product of the 1950s and onwards, but at origin a reflection of the ways in which Turkish history was refashioned under Ataturk from the 1920s, as well as a reflection of efforts both to decolonialize Turkey's cultural heritage and of pressures in respect of international and national politics. I should add, though, that this tradition has also, and in the last few years, been challenged uh, to some degree, notably in some recent TV satires. I'm thinking in particular of, um, and the title is indicative, of a television series by Gani Mujde called uh, Byzance Oyonara, or Game of Byzance. So it is not the case that Byzantium is not taught about or mentioned. If you go online, you'll find hundreds of sites and blogs in which Byzantium appears, some reputable, many less so. But misinformation and misunderstanding still dominates. Given that the reception of Byzantium plays a different and very different role in Western Europe from that which it plays in the Balkans or Southeastern Europe or again in Turkey or in the Middle East, we will need different strategies in these different regions. As I remarked already, one of the hallmarks of popular misconceptions about Byzantium, where it figures in the general consciousness at all, is an assumption of unchangingness, of an almost static, hieratic society and culture. Indeed, we face a more or less complete ignorance of the central role of medieval Eastern Roman culture, politics, and history played in molding key features of the formation of the modern European world, in spite of efforts on the part of those who have access to a more balanced view of the past. If this Congress receives any publicity at all among the wider general public, it is to be hoped that it might mark the beginning of a substantial improvement in this situation. And the organizers and the International Association are to be congratulated on choosing a theme that can reflect not only current scholarship and advances in understanding, but that will contribute positively to a continuing deconstruction of these inaccurate and out-of-date notions. Emphasis on change and the ways in which change can be apprehended and explained represents one way to tackle some of these views. There are, as the contributions to this Congress show very clearly, many levels at which we work to enhance our understanding of the medieval East Roman world and its neighbors, from the absolutely essential groundwork of analyzing and describing the material cultural evidence at our disposal, the documents, monuments, archeological and environmental data in which our attempts to grasp the past must be grounded, through the interpretation and historical contextualization of this material, to broader, more holistic interpretations of the ebb and flow of societal evolution and of economic, political, and cultural change. It is perhaps at this last level 
that our efforts at understanding change sets us the greatest challenges. Understanding how and why change occurs is a complicated matter. We all have different ways of approaching the issue, and there is even a sociology of theories of change deployed in social resource planning that we might draw on. We might start, for example, at a conceptual level and think of societies as a series of overlapping and intersecting social processes in which social praxis and institutions, as well as political systems, respond to changing conditions through a process of competitive selection. That is to say, where certain ways of doing things or of organizing relationships respond adequately or inadequately to changes in their circumstances. Those sets of relationships that fail to respond adequately tend to be either abandoned completely or to be transformed and transmuted in such a way that they can respond functionally to the changed context. And where we can identify these, we can begin to locate the causal mechanisms at work. More recently, social theorists and social historians have begun to employ a vocabulary and a range of approaches drawn from what has been dubbed complexity theory, the science of nonlinear dynamics, drawn in its turn from mathematics, for example, uh, chaos theory, uh, from computer science, and from the physical sciences more broadly. Those who have deployed elements of complexity theory challenge the principles of linear explanation and causation and accept that complete knowledge of given phenomena is impossible to achieve. They place emphasis instead on the apparent randomness of causation, in which the interplay of multiple human actors with one another, within behavior determining social and institutional contexts, and with the physical environment, generate emergent social praxis. Societies are thus seen as complex adaptive systems, and emphasis is placed on the unpredictability of possible outcomes, or in historical terms, of knowing all the causal elements leading to a particular result. It is a little ironic, it seems to me, that complexity, uh, complexity theory or chaos theory itself derives in part from work influenced by the so-called uncertainty principle developed in the 1920s by the physicist and Nobel Prize winner Werner Heisenberg, the son of the Munich Byzantinist August Heisenberg. Much of this is perhaps pretty obvious, maybe even common sense, from our historians' perspectives. And the extent to which we deploy some or all or none of such reproaches reflects our own personal philosophies of history, that is to say, our own approaches to the past and why we study it. But it does often help to make our assumptions explicit, if only to make it clear to our colleagues where we are coming from and what the basis for our analyses might be. But in order to ask any questions at all about change and how and why it occurs, it is helpful to try to establish at what level of magnitude the changes we want to identify and account for operated, and how elements within those different levels interacted. For myself, I tend to think in terms of three temporal or chronological frameworks across which we can examine states and social systems, for example, similar in concept, if not exactly equivalent to Brodel's long-term middle and short durée. There is what we might call the macro level of causal relationships, well illustrated in some recent work in which comparisons on a global scale across several millennia posit very long-term evolutionary pathways determined primarily by ecological conditions. Once a particular set of conditions has stimulated a particular set of responses in terms of demographics, reproductive patterns, nutritional systems, and technologies, then micro-level shifts and causal relationships are determined in their effects entirely within that set of constraints. At this level of generality, of course, the value of specific data in terms of historical political systems is merely that it should not contradict the evolutionary pathways thus sketched out, and it's of little help in determining the causal relationships behind the rise and fall of specific historical systems. At a middling level of explanation, we can begin to grapple with issues pertaining to individual, cultural, and social systems, and the ways in which a particular trajectory of development has evolved. Here, we are confronted with specific, but broadly located, social, economic, and political systems, set within known geopolitical contexts, and the particular types of political structure with which they have been associated. While such differences, 
tend also to reflect fairly straightforwardly geographical catchment areas, broad comparativist discussion has to be based on the careful empirical study of particular societies. Lastly, we arrive at a micro level of causal associations at which we need to differentiate within these much broader frames of reference to describe and then analyze local variations in both time and space affected by specific divergences in social praxis and fortuitous shifts in social relations instigated by issues of resource availability, competition and access to centers of production and distribution, density and rate of reproduction of population groups, and the contingent patterns of kinship, control of resources, and allocation of power and authority, which are the products of those highly specific conditions. This is, in fact, the level of analysis with which most of us are presently concerned in one way or another. As I noted a few minutes ago, most of us are involved with the mechanics of the civilization we study, by which I mean, firstly, our written and material cultural sources and the methodological issues that come with them. And secondly, how to interpret these sources in such a way as to offer plausible accounts of the actual workings of East Roman society or politics, culture or literary production, modes of representation or gender identities and relations. And crucially, how, when and why these may have changed across time. Byzantium was a society uh, of contrasts. For most of its history, a mass of provincial rural producers uh, uh, and a few major urban centers. Constantinople, the queen of cities, the second Rome, was by far the largest and wealthiest. Ceremony and ritual were fundamental components both of court life and of Byzantine understanding of the world, and it's often these elements that are singled out as evidence for the unchanging nature of the East Roman civilization. But we forget at our peril that like all modern society, all pre-modern societies, it was deeply divided along both horizontal and vertical axes. Vertically, by clan and family loyalties and identities, ethnic and linguistic markers, religious differences, quite apart from gender divisions of labor and culturally determined patterns of behavior. And horizontally, by differences between rich and poor, owners and non-owners, landlords and tenants, and so forth. In the course of the great length of its existence, there took place considerable changes in state and political organization, as well as in social and cultural values and relationships. And while there are enough constants and continuities to make the use of one term for the whole social and political formation entirely legitimate, the state and society of the 15th century are obviously very different indeed from those of the 6th. Yet it is again, to some extent, this very continuity that has been in part responsible for the misunderstandings I've mentioned. It seems to me that the most efficacious way to challenge such views is to emphasize the dynamism of East Roman culture, society, and politics, to point out change, resilience, and the fluid nature of social and political relationships, and in particular, the different rates of change affecting different levels of social, cultural, and political life. One way of doing this, and to help explain the quality of East Roman political and cultural longevity, is to look at Byzantine society and culture from the point of view of resilience. Looking at resilience, adaptation, and sustainability within a culture and across a particular period helps both to problematize past approaches to change and to suggest appropriate strategies for moving forward. Resilience is a notion that's used in many ways by many researchers in different fields. In some cases, for example, as an alternative to sustainability. And we need, of course, to be quite clear about how we want to deploy it. It plays a particularly important role in paleoanthropology and archaeology, for example. Resilience indicates the ability to make rapid changes with no measurable harm to the system as a whole. It's about the ways in which cultural systems include elements of redundancy and, and adaptability within them, buffers, in effect, that keep them going through and past shocks. There is indeed a whole school of thought devoted to formal resilience theory. And if you look it up online, you'll see there's a website for it. How might this help in explaining change in Byzantium? Well, first of all, it offers a comparativist framework within which to compare Byzantium with other cultural systems, 
perhaps those with which our prospective audience might already be familiar, and it encourages us to situate the world we study in the context of its resources, the cost of extracting, distributing, and using such resources, and of the impact on society and ideas of changes in that context. Comparing Byzantium on this basis with the medieval West, with the Islamic polities to the East, or with cultural systems even further afield, is one obvious way of contrasting different outcomes over the medium and longer term, especially if we try to home in on the mechanics of resilience. Thinking about Byzantium in terms of complex adaptive social systems and resilience, putting Byzantium into a global framework, and showing how, in its way, it was as much part of a world system as any other culture of the period can surely help. Historians understand causal relationships from the point of view of multiple interrelated social, cultural, economic, and political factors. Climate scientists, in contrast, think in terms of, of environmental impacts on agriculture, warfare, demographics, and long-term changes. No one, I think, can now doubt that climate, environment, and societal development are linked in causally complex ways, nor that climate impacts on society, on the economy, and therefore on social and political history in all sorts of ways, some of them obvious, some virtually imperceptible. When we further observe the impact that shifts in overall climatic conditions have on some parts of the world today, the question of the degree to which human social evolution is at least nuanced and inflected by climate is, it seems to me, unavoidable. Simplistic one-to-one -one determinisms are, of course, entirely inadequate. Too many writers have juxtaposed graphs of climate deterioration with charts of societal and political change and crisis and stated that a causal connection existed without actually demonstrating how this can be. Human social organization is, I pointed, is, as I pointed out, complex, and societal reaction to change can rarely, if ever, be understood from a monocausal perspective. And this is where work on micro-regions becomes essential. Every region generates its own environmental subsystems, determined by its physical geography and prevailing patterns of weather. Crucially, such environmental subsystems can have a dramatically different impact, region to region, on societal arrangements. Only through close analysis of each of these microstructures is it possible to elucidate the causal relationship between climate and society. I mention all this because I think there has been some significant and influential work in the last 10 to 20 years on the impact of climatic and environmental factors in the Byzantine world. Work that offers another way into demonstrating both the fact of change as well as the dynamic nature of Byzantine society, economy, and cultures. One of the biggest and most interesting challenges is to understand why outcomes in contiguous regions and cultures, often sharing the same broad patterns of climate and culture, can be so different. Again, this requires close and detailed microanalysis and equally close collaboration between climate and environmental scientists and historians and social and political and economic historians on the other hand. But it sets up many challenges and there are many fundamental differences of opinion in respect of interpreting the evidence. By way of example, very briefly, some important recent work comparing dendro data, tree ring uh, data, from the Altai region in Mongolia uh, with that from the Austrian Alps shows clearly consistent parallels in terms of chronology and pattern across the period from the 5th to the 10th century. Combined with the data extracted from other proxy sources, especially that from polar ice cores, the evidence indicates a period of substantial cooling that set in across Eurasia in the period from the 530s to the 660s, a period that the authors have dubbed the Late Antique Little Ice Age. When compared against the archaeological and historical data for these years, it is clear that this cooling phase coincides with some equally dramatic changes observable in the historical record. The recurring incidence of plague across Eurasia from the 530s, migratory movements in both the western and eastern zones of Eurasia, and the breakdown, decline, or transformation of major socio-political systems, including the development of the early Islamic empire. But of course, the parallel in itself says nothing about the causal associations that may or may not have pertained. In the case of this so-called late antique little ice age, we seem to have a pretty clear a priori case 
for assuming that a dramatic period of cooling that can be dated reasonably precisely and that coincided with substantial societal change across a large part of the Earth's surface had a causal impact. But how exactly is this causal impact to be understood and measured? And what were the mechanics of societal response in the regions and among the cultures most affected? Once again, close, detailed analysis of all the relevant factors is essential. But the main point here is to note that by placing the East Roman or Byzantine world into a global context, we have a better chance of showing persuasively both that change was a constant, but also that we are dealing here with a socio-cultural formation that was really remarkably resilient in every sense. This is precisely the opposite of so much conventional wisdom among non-specialists. A final way of approaching the question of change is to look at what we can know about what people believed, both as individuals and as a social whole, about the world they inhabit and the events around them, as well as what they thought or may have thought about the past. This applies not just to systems of religious belief and thought, but to the ways in which literacy is deployed by different sectors within a society and to the ways in which motifs drawn from the cultural heritage of a society are selected and redeployed to explain the world and to legitimate change or opposition to change. For example, states can often have an ideological life which is not necessarily tied to their actual political and institutional efficacy or power because political ideologies and belief systems once in existence are often able to adapt and to survive in conditions which have evolved well away from those within which they were originally engendered. But political ideologies too can be extremely flexible. They may provide a rationale for conflict where no visible or obvious reason, in terms of competition for resources for example, exists. They can be extremely powerful as we know. But we can illustrate another aspect of the dynamism of Byzantine culture and society precisely through an analysis of its intellectual life on the one hand and of popular belief on a wider scale where we have the evidence uh, on the other. By placing these in a comparative context and by demonstrating the degree of resilience and the various elements that constituted such resilience, uh, we can challenge yet again some of the prejudices I mentioned earlier. In the last analysis, the point I want to make is quite simply that change is a constant. And it's a constant in all social systems, however stable they might be, and however great the degree of continuity of forms and structural relationships. We should not confuse stable with static. To us as historians, this is perhaps obvious, but communicating the dynamism of a medieval society whose modes of expression and psychology are so very different from those of our own culture or cultures is one of our biggest challenges. There are many others, and there are many approaches to the challenge, but I hope I've been able to suggest some of the ways through which it can be done, and done in such a way as to draw attention to the Byzantine world as, in different ways, a dynamic part of all of our histories. Thank you very much for your attention. Dragi prijatelji, hvala svima što ste podelili sa nama radost i čast svečanog otvaranja 23. Međunarodnog kongresa Vizantijskih studija. Svim učesnicima želim uspešan rad i prijaten boravak u Beogradu. Živeli! Dear friends, thank you all for sharing with us the joy and honor of the opening of the 23rd International Congress of Byzantine Studies. Wish all the participants fruitful working proceedings and a pleasant stay in Belgrade. Once again, welcome.